So, good afternoon and uh, good Monday for you. Uh, today's lecture will be about, first we'll talk about decorated pause trees, then uh, syntax directed translations, and then the main subject today is uh, bison or um, yak, which is an older version of bison. Uh, that is parser generators, where you put in the grammar and it will generate a parser for you. Uh, first of all, decorated parse trees. Well, when you decorate a Christmas tree, here's the Christmas tree, you put various things in it. And it's the same thing when decorating a parse tree. Let's say we have a grammar. Uh, an expression can be either a number, and I'm trying to draw boxes around the, the uh, non-term, uh, the terminals, the tokens. So an expression can be a number, or you can have one expression plus another expression, or you can have an expression divided by another expression. So we have a small language that lets you add and divide numbers. And as you remember from before, this is an ambiguous grammar. Uh, we say nothing about the priority of plus and division, and we say nothing about the associativity of the operators. But we ignore that for today. Some example input, um, 2 divided by 3 plus 5. And if we leave space here for the pause tree, if we leave space here for the pause tree and put a, the token stream down here, uh, the token stream will be, well, 2 is a number, so you get the token number, then you get the division operator, which is a token, you get another number, uh, you get plus, and you get a number. And you remember when we talked about scanners, we also talked about lexical values. Uh, the lexical value of the first number here, well, it's of course, which number is it? So, this is the number 2, here you have the number 3, and the number 5. So these are lexical values. Division and plus don't have any lexical values, they, I mean, they are just division and plus. So, let's build a parse tree from this. If we start from the top, well, the only non-terminal we have is expression, so uh, <coughs> that will be the start symbol, which will be our root node. And if we switch down here to start from, uh, from the bottom up, uh, each number has to uh, be interpreted as an expression or reduced to expression. Otherwise, we won't be able to do anything with them. And since we have an ambiguous grammar, we could start with plus or we could start with division. But let's start from the left here and say that this expression divided by this expression is a new expression. And then we have this expression plus this expression, which gives the complete expression. So far, it's just a parse tree. We've seen this before, but now we are going to decorate it. <coughs> that is, we uh, decide that there are some attributes, some, um, you can call it variables, uh, that we want to put in each node. And one thing you could use, one attribute you could use is the value. If you divide 2 by 3, well, you get a value, you get uh, 2 thirds. 
So let's put a value on each um, uh, of all these expressions here. Uh, this one, well, you probably get a value from the number, the token itself. And the value of the token number two is of course two. So I say this is the value two. And when you interpret that number as an expression using this production, well, the value of that expression is still two. And if we look at the value of this number, what is it? Three, Three yes. Uh, correction here, value of three. And when you reduce that number to expression, well, the value will, unless we're doing something very strange with this language, uh, <coughs> it will be three. So what will the value of two divided by three be? Well, that depends on the language. If we uh, use C or C++, then uh, the compiler will look at, okay, this is an integer two, this is an integer three, so we do integer division and get zero because two divided by three and throw away the decimals is zero. If we use Python version two, we get the same behavior integer divided by integer is integer, also zero, or if we use Python version 3, then they change the behavior of the division operator, so 2 divided by 3 becomes a floating point number, so you get 0 0.6667. So if we use the Python rules here, then the value of this expression is uh, 0.6667, or as many decimals as, as your floating point numbers allow. And to complete the example, let's look at this expression, or rather this number. The value is 5. When you reduce it to expression, or interpret this number as an expression, the value is still 5. Uh, what's the difference between this 3 and this another 3? that we write uh, instead expression, divide instead expression. Uh, the <coughs> above this value of 0, 0 0.666. Yes. Uh, we write, we, we usually write uh, state uh, di this division or? Uh, this division, uh, <coughs> this one, gives us a floating point number. Uh, okay. No, I I mean if we wrote division, okay, it's in state expression. So it will be two, two and three and above but in state expression we, we write division, you know? I'm not sure I follow the question. I mean, you have, you have this rule that an expression can be divided by another expression. Oh, okay. So it, all, all we can do in this language is plus and division. Oh, okay. okay. So uh, <coughs> to complete the example here, um, you have this expression, 2 divided by 3, which is 0 0.6667. Uh, plus this uh, other expression here, which has the value 5. So, assuming we have some sort of expected normal behavior of plus, we will get a value of what? What will the value be? Uh, 5.6. Yeah, right. <coughs> now, so one attribute you could add to this parse tree, to decorate this parse tree, is the values. You calculate the values. Uh, another thing is the data type. I mean, what is the data type of the number two? Well, it's an integer of some kind. So the data type is integer. 
Uh, here, the number three, well, it's also integer, because we assume now that all numbers in the input are integers. You can't have any floating point numbers, or you can't have any numbers with decimals. And in the same way that uh, the value 2 uh, follows or flows up in the tree, Uh, you will get the type of this expression. Well, since the, the expression consists of a single number, which is an integer, it seems reasonable that we call the type of the expression integer. And on this, uh, in the same way on the other side here, uh, the type of the expression 3 is also integer. But the interesting part is this expression. As you saw, uh, when we divide two numbers, uh, we get a floating point number, even if we divide two integers, if we use Python 3 rules. So here we have a float. And if we go to the other side, you have the number 5, which also has, of course, the type int. Uh, when you reduce it to an expression, or interpret it as an expression, the type will still be int. Uh, yeah? Can I can also have a question. How, uh, how did you get flow if you divide integer by integer? Uh, Python 3 rules. Mm. If you want to have integer division in Python, you need to have this special integer operation. Integer division operator. Uh, and... Well, we already see that we have a floating point number here. So, as in Python, as in uh, many other languages, if you have a floating point number plus an integer, you get a result which is a floating point number. So, I'm saying the type here is float. In Python, if you had two integers, you would get uh, an integer as the result of the addition. Uh, so division is special here. It does not work like the other operators. OK, this is a decorated parse tree with two attributes. Two attributes, where you put attribute values on the nodes in the tree. Uh, you could have more attributes. For example, uh, generated executable code. If you want to generate it in the parser, you could uh, put generated code here. Uh, for example, if you use uh, postfix notation, our program which generates postfix, uh, well, what is the postfix code for the number 5? Well, it is just 5. What is the postfix code for the number 2? Well, it is 2. What is the postfix code for the number 3? And finally, here, the postfix code for this division, 2 and 3. Well, it is the code for this one, 2, the code for this one, 3, and then postfix, you put the operator at the end. So the postfix code for this subtree here is 2, 3 division. And up here you get postfix uh, for this subtree, then that subtree, and then the operator. So you have this postfix code, 2, 3 division, followed by postfix code for this subtree, which is 5, followed by the operator plus. So you can have all sorts of things as values of the attributes. You have uh, the attribute value, which uh, says what value it has. You have the attribute type. And now we have three attributes with uh, the postfix code. OK? So let's move now 
uh, to uh, these syntax-directed translations, now that we know what a decorated parse tree is. And um, we have two types of syntax-directed translations. One is called a syntax-directed definition, which works with these attributes. And we have something else called a syntax-directed translation scheme, which instead uh, inserts uh, actions in the grammar. But we'll look at that in a moment. So let me erase this. Two types of syntax directed translation. And why is it called syntax directed translation? Well, translation because it's part of the compiler that translates uh, from one language, the source language, to another language, the target language. And syntax directed because it's all based on the syntax, all based on the grammar. We have first the syntax directed definition and also the syntax directed translation scheme. So, we start with the syntax-directed definition. Uh, as I said, the syntax-directed definition is about these attribute values. And what you do is you make a sort of table with first the productions and then the rules you use to assign the values of these attributes. So here's my table. It says production here in one column. And then we have a rule. We call it the semantic rule. Rule. Or maybe even a bit wider. So. Uh, and why is it called a semantic rule? Well, as again, as we've said, semantics is about meaning. What does our program mean? And one meaning of this program is the things we calculate that this will result in a floating point number with a value 5.67. So that is why we call the rules semantic rules. But they are really about uh, creating attribute values for the nodes. Uh, it does not have very much to do with the semantic phase of the compiler. So let's start with the first rule you have. You have the rule that says an expression can be a number. So how will the rule, well, if we start with the values, and this expression point value means that in a part of the tree like this, where a number is reduced to an expression, or we have an expression that is a number, then you take the value of that number and put it as the value of the entire expression. 
Of course, I mean, if the expression consists of number two, the value of the entire expression is two. And expression point value is the attribute value in this expression node. And what is that? Well, uh, take the number, and we assume we have a value that we can get from that number, point value. So just copy the value from the actual number to the expression. And if you want to do the same thing with the type, then you have expression dot type, which, well, if we only have integers, if a number is necessarily an integer, then this will always be integer. But if we could have floating point numbers, so I could have 2.0 there, then I might, then I would need to inherit or use the type from the token. But let me say, let's say integer here. We know that we only have integers to work with, so the expression of a single number, uh, the type of a single number is integer. Okay? So this is our first <coughs> production. Then we can take, let's take expression divided by expression. So one expression can be another expression divided by a third expression. And so we know which of all these three expressions is which. I will call the first one expression 1, the second expression 2, and the third expression 3. So in this case, where we have division here, then this is expression 1, this is expression 2, and this is expression 3. But it's just when we look at uh, the attributes for this node. Then if we had a division again, then this might be expression 2. Okay, so the value, well, again, you say expression, and since it's expression 1's value I'm going to calculate, uh, it is just expression 2's value divided by expression 3's value, as we did here in uh, in the parse tree. We took, we took the values divided by each other and put as uh, the value of the value attribute. Which of them uh, is uh, expression 3? This one. I mean, you have... <coughs> uh, it doesn't really matter. The, these are just numbers I put here now, so, so we don't confuse them with each, with each other. But expression 1 is the division expression, and expression 2 is the first argument, and expression 3 is the second argument to the division. Okay. In this case, expression 1, expression 2, expression 3. And the data type, well, <coughs> the data type we assign here, expression 1 point Type is what? Float. Yes, always float because at least we have said here that division always yields a floating point number unless we use this um, uh, integer division operator. So this is float. What about? our third production, that an expression, call it expression 1, uh, can, be, can be an expression 2 plus an expression 3. Well, the value is simple. You just add the values. Uh, expression 1, in this case, this will be expression 1, so this will now be expression 2, and this will be expression 3. So these numbers, expression 1, expression 2, and so on, is just <coughs> uh, when, when we're working with a node. We can't say expression 4. Well, we, we could, no, no, we shouldn't have expression 4, because 
This is expression one when we are working with the attribute values for this node based on the attribute values for this and this node. But we could have called them some, we could have called them something else, yes. Okay, expression one's value, the in this case the root node's value. Yes. We add them together. How is it with um, the type? Well, in this case it will be flow, but what should the, the semantic rule, the rule for type? If we again use Python's type system, what will the rule say? Well, the thing in Python is, <coughs> if you do uh, if you do integer plus integer, then you get an integer. But if you have at least one floating point number, then you get a floating point number. So we need to look at the types. And assuming we just have these two data types, float and int, if expression two dot type is float, or expression three dot type is float, that is, if we have at least one floating point number, then the result will be floating point. Expression one dot type is set to float. Else, else, if we don't have any floating point numbers, then everything is integer. So in that case, else, expression one dot type is set to integer. This is about the same rule we have in many other languages, C, C++, Java and so on. If you have integer plus integer, you get integer. If you have float plus float, you get float. If you have integer plus float, or the other way around, uh, you get float. So, now you see what a syntax-directed definition is. It is a table with the productions and then semantic rules to set attribute values. We uh, call it a definition because we define the values of the attributes using these rules. Okay. That was a <coughs> syntax-directed definition. Now, a syntax-directed translation scheme. And now I'll have to delete this uh, pores tree here because otherwise I won't have space. Uh, we take the same grammar, but we add some um, uh, actions to that grammar. Yeah. We have the same grammar, but let's say we, as we've seen before, want to generate PostScript code. Okay? If I have this production, an expression consists of a number. Uh, <coughs> what should I do to generate PostScript code for that number? Well, I print the number. Or store it somewhere, but let's use the simplest possible way. Uh, I add some of these curly brackets. 
just to signify that this, this uh, shows the um, yeah, this uh, shows a semantic action. And what do we do? Well, we print P or I and T uh, the numbers value number point value. So the postfix code for seven is seven. Again, it's semantic in the sense that what is our language doing? Well, it's generating PostScript code. We don't just syntactically parse the input. Uh, we also generate some output here that is the result of what we do. And it's not a rule that says anything about attributes. Instead, it's an action, something we actually do. We print on the screen. Okay. If I have um, the second, or we can take uh, the same order. Uh, no, we take uh, we take this order. Uh, expression plus expression. If I have an expression and then another expression, and I want to add them together using postfix, which semantic action do I need? Well, you could think that I need a lot of actions to print the code for this expression and for that expression, but let's say that they are two numbers. They, it's uh, two plus three. Well, then we have already printed them when we parsed those expressions. So we parse this expression, the number two, and we parse this expression, the number three, and then we use, we would have used this semantic action to print two and three. So we have already printed them. When we have found this expression that consists of an expression plus another expression, we have already printed the sub-expressions. So all I need to do to generate postfix code is just to print a plus at an end. Because I have the first expression, then the second expression, and then I add the results together. So here, all I do is print plus. And even if it's much more complicated sub-expressions, if the sub-expressions are more complicated, well, still, they will have printed everything that's needed to calculate the first one and the second one. All I need to do is print plus at the end. To generate the To generate postfix, yes, yes. If it's infix, <coughs> then I would need to print the plus here in the middle. And if it's prefix, I print it first. And in those cases, I would need some, some uh, parenthesis to disambiguate the result. So, the final production, an expression can expand to expression divided by expression. Again, when we have gotten as far as this. We have found an expression divided by another expression. We have already printed everything needed for this expression and for that expression. So all we need to do is to divide the numbers. So at the end here, we have print division, like this. And if I try to apply this to our old two divided by three plus five. Well, again, this is a number, this is a number, and this is a number. All the numbers are interpreted as expressions, or reduced to expressions. And two divided by three is an expression, and the result of that plus five is another expression. How will this work with these printouts? Well, <clears throat> when we start by parsing this number two and find that, oh, this expression is the number two, then we use this rule, so this will print two. Then we're not going to go down here because first we need to go down uh, the other subtree. 
see that, oh, here we have a number three, that is an expression. Again, we use the same rule. So we print three. And then we see that, oh, that expression divided by that expression is an expression. So we're applying this rule, we print the division at the end. And now we have a complete postfix code for this entire subtree. And we will parse this subtree too, which gives five. And then at the end, we have that subtree plus that subtree, that is this expression plus this expression. So we just print the plus at the end. And we have the postfix code. Okay. We will see that Bison can do both these things. You can put semantic actions in the middle of your grammar and the grammar that Bison generates will perform these. And you also have a system with attributes. Uh, I could call them dollar values because you use a dollar sign to print them, uh, to work with them, uh, <coughs> which lets you work with attributes. So we will leave these syntax directed translations and continue with Bison. Okay? Thomas, yes. Do we need to consider uh, left recursion? No. Uh, in this case, you have all sorts of problems with left recursion. So if you want to write a parser, a top-down parser, an LL parser, then this would not work. You would need to rewrite the gram. But we're, first of all, we're ignoring, we're not really talking about, yet we're not really talking about parsers. This is just the parse tree that the parser, in some magical way, created for us. But when we go on now with Bison, Bison will generate a bottom-up parser that handles both left recursion and when we have, like we have in all these cases, uh, first conflicts. So for Bison and the grammar we give to Bison, we don't need to worry about uh, these things. That's just for top-down parsers. Okay. Uh, YAC uh, stands for yet another compiler compiler because it's a program that sort of compiles your compiler for you even if it's mm, almost entirely the parser it creates for you. Uh, Bison is a newer version with free uh, or open source code. Uh, and it's the one that everyone uses now. Even if sometimes you get a program that is called Yak, but which usually is Bison. And what you do is you <coughs> write a file. Let's say you want to write a Java compiler. I write a file which is called java.y, where y stands for the Bison, which is the grammar for Java with some specific uh, ways of writing it. So here you have this file. It says things like an expression is an expression plus another expression and so on. This is just an example of one single uh, rule. You run this through, here we have Bison. And out you get a file, a file called java.tab.c, which is the actual parser, or rather the C code for the actual parser. Uh, to uh, create the compiler, you will need to run this through uh, a C compiler. 
such as GCC. And you get, well, as you remember, the compiler itself just gives a module which then needs to be linked together with some other stuff. But uh, <coughs> after that step, you get the actual Java compiler. And let me try to draw a Java compiler here. You insert a... Uh, foo.java, this is just some Java program, and out you get, well, you don't get actual computable, uh, executable code, you get a, a file that says foo.class, which can then be run by the Java interpreter. Anyway, Bison creates uh, C source code for the parser. Uh, sometimes, you, you, you need to have other code that works together with the parser, for example, the scanner. And when your scanner finds a certain token, let's say a number, an integer, it needs to tell the parser, oh, I found an integer. So you need to interface this, the scanner and the parser. <coughs> so if I add the flag minus D, this will also generate the file called java.tab.h, which contains things like uh, uh, a number. The token num is really the number 710. So when the scanner has found a number, it tells the parser that, OK, I found a number. But what it really says is that, OK, I found a token of type 710. So when you uh, interface the parser to the other, types of, uh, the other parts of your compiler, uh, you need this definitions file, this header file, which you get by saying bison minus d. OK? And after the break, we will look at how this input file to Bison looks. Yes? A step in there. Uh, from Bison, we get... From Bison, we get... From Bison, we get a, f a C file, you say? Yes. And the C file, we give it to the GCC? Yeah, GCC. we compile it with our normal C compiler. It produces a... It, it produces a link module, so if you compile it, you actually get java.tab.o and you need to link it together. But if you just compile it with GCC and say that you want, uh, GCC usually calls the linker also. So this is just be, being careful to not say something that is wrong. And the, the object file, we give it to the Java compiler. Uh, actually, this object file, uh, <coughs> here we have the linker. L for linker, and you send that one in there, and some other files, for example, if you have a scanner in a separate file, in a separate source file, you compile the scanner, uh, link everything together to get the complete compiler. So this is the result, <coughs> the compiler, which compiles Java code. Okay. Because we said we're, we're building a Java compiler, so here we have a Java grammar. Okay, so that one is a result. That the result, this is our compiler that we have built using Bison. Okay, break. So let's look at the input file that we give to Bison uh, to let it generate our parser for us. So if we um, again assume it's a compiler for Java that we are writing, we call the file java.y and the basic structure is you have three parts separated by percent percent. Here you have declarations, and we will look at more exactly what they are. Here we have the actual rules, the productions for the grammar. And here we have a part where you can put 
C code that you need for things. Okay? And in more detail, again, an example. If we have the declarations part first, before the first percent percent, uh, you can have some uh, C declarations within uh, these uh, curly brackets, but with percent signs, so percent start and percent end of the C declarations. Here you can put things like an include file, stdio.h, because, <coughs> as I said, you have C code down here. And you will, inside the productions, you will put semantic actions, which also will consist of C code. So, you might need things included, uh, a standard include file like stdio, or uh, if you've looked at the 2.9 program, you have global.h. And if you have uh, other declarations, such as this, uh, uh, external variable called token val. So, these are C declarations. So, this part is just copied directly to the output. So, when you compile your parser with the C compiler, uh, <coughs> it sees this code as is. And then, so if this part is C declarations, you will have bison declarations down here. And the main thing you will define here is the tokens. So you can say percent token uh, ID for an identifier, num for a number, uh, and other things, let's say the keyword if, the keyword else, and so on. So these are the tokens that the parser will use in its, uh, in its productions. And some more stuff that we'll, we'll look at later. But the main thing is these um, uh, token types. Then, we continue. <coughs> Here we have the rules. And uh, if you have a grammar that says that your uh, program consists of a list of expressions, and you're, if you have looked again at the 2.9 program, that grammar says that the input consists of a list of expressions. You can say that the token Start consists of a list, and then you have a done token. Let's say uh, we add the token done here that the scanner inputs at the end of the input. And a semicolon at the end. And since we can have several lines in such a definition. Usually we format it this way, but it's nothing that says that a semicolon has to be there. It could also be there. Just in some way say that the semicolon ends. So this is the same thing as saying that the non-terminal start uh, expands to list followed by done. So this is the way we've written grammars before, but <coughs> we have colon instead of, uh, of arrow. What is a list? Well, maybe you remember that a list is either an expression followed by semicolon, followed by a new list, or it can be empty. So this rule from the grammar, how do we write that? Well, uh, we say that a list, colon, is expression 
followed by semicolon. And to distinguish this semicolon, that is the end of this bison rule, uh, from this semicolon, that is something found in the input. We set quotes around it. Which also, sh also shows that we can use tokens. Uh, the scanner can give us tokens in the form of single characters. You don't have to define uh, each token like semicolon and plus and so on here. Uh, you can just use the actual characters. Okay, uh, expression and then follows a list. Or this, um, the same um, uh, pipe character that you use for uh, bitwise or in, uh, in C and C++. And if you have two of them, you have a logical or. It can be empty. And this is the way you typically write this. So we clearly see that you have one production that says a list can be this. And you have another production that says a list can be this, namely empty. And you can have a percent. Uh, no, you can have, well, these two you can have. And to uh, mark clearly that, okay, I didn't just forget to write something there. You could write a comment that says that, yes, this should be empty. Or, because Bison might give you a warning, it doesn't understand this. Uh, you can say that percent empty, I actually mean to leave this empty. Okay. And what is an expression? Well, you can have um, uh, an expression. <coughs> if you again remember the grammar from the 2.9 program, uh, it says that an expression can be an expression plus a term. You, so, so to speak, add a, uh, you chain a term to the end of the expression. Or it can be a single term. And those are the two things that an expression can be. Now, you remember semantic actions. We said that if we have uh, an expression plus an expression, to generate postfix code, we need to print the postfix code for the first expression and then for the second expression, and then finally the plus. So if we want to add some uh, semantic actions here, we can do so. So, semantic action, printf plus. And this is actual C code. Again, like these C declarations, this is just fed through Bison and put in the output file. So in the output file it will say print, it will say printf uh, plus. Yeah, uh, in the example today we have expression plus expression. This is the same grammar as you had in the 2.9 program. You had expression plus term. So this one uh, will take care of associativity and then since a term consists of things that you add together, you will have uh, uh, <coughs> uh, also handle operator priority. So this is a better grammar. So you can add these semantic actions in your grammar. And then after this part with all the rules, now this is not complete, I mean you need to say what the term is also. And the term will consist of factors and factors will consist of uh, uh, numbers and IDs. 
Uh, but this is the, the format of the grammar. We will go on and show an actual calculator that calculates. And to do that, we will, you remember the uh, decorated parse trees with attribute values. We will see how Bison handles attribute values. Because if you want to build a calculator that actually calculates values, well, you could generate postfix code and then write your own postfix interpreter that, that uh, puts things on a stack and handles operators. But we can use attribute values, which will be easier. So let's um, remove this example and continue with this example with a calculator that actually can calculate things such as uh, 2 plus 3 times 4 plus 5. And what we wanted to do is to do things correctly. 3 times 4 is 12, 2 plus 12 is 14, and 14 plus 5 is 19. So we get the correct result. Again, we have this um, C declaration section, include stdio.h, because if nothing else, I want to print the result. Uh, I will include, well, other header files that I might need or that I will need. For example, C type.h has macros of the type is digit that checks if a character is a digit and so on. Then we have the um, uh, the bison declarations and now I'm not using numbers I'm we will work with only single digit numbers. So I have a, uh, a token called digit. I will also have the tokens plus and multiplication. But those I don't need to declare because I actually use these single character, uh, the single characters. And now comes the actual uh, grammar. So this will be more like the 2.5 program that lets you use only single digit numbers and you don't end the expression with a semicolon, you just press enter and each line that you enter is, uh, will be interpreted as one expression. So, what is a line? Well, it's an expression followed by end of line, which is like in C, you can write it as backslash end, which means end of line. And then, well, when I've entered one line, I want to print it, the result. So we have printf, and I'm printing a number, so I use percent %d just to print a number. But how do I get the number? Where do I find the number? Here comes the attributes of the parse tree. In Bison, you have what could be called a dollar system. The attribute value of the first thing after the uh, colon on the right hand side is called dollar one. The attribute value of the second one is called dollar two. Now, uh, this is just end of line, so it won't have much of an attribute value. And the resulting left hand side will have an attribute value called dollar dollar. 
or an attribute called $$. So these are by default integers. So to print the value of the expression, I say $1. And as you can see, this is not really C code. Dollar one, you can't write that in C. So I lied when I said that these uh, semantic actions will be just copied to the output. Uh, <coughs> Bison will replace dollar one with some variable that it uses internally to store this dollar one value. And semicolon to show the end of the rule. And let's take, uh, let's continue over here. Uh, you have expressions. So what is an expression? Well, an expression is either uh, an expression plus a term, or it is a single term. So we have this simple grammar that lets us add things. And it takes care of operator priority and uh, press, uh, associativity. If I have an expression plus something that is a term, well, how do I calculate the value? Well, again, the dollar things. Dollar one, dollar two, dollar three. Notice that this is also a part of the right hand side, so it gets its own dollar number. And dollar dollar. So to calculate the result of an expression plus a term, you write a semantic action that says dollar dollar equals dollar one plus dollar three. So So if your expression consists of an expression plus a term, well, to calculate the value of the total expression, you take this expression, its value, plus the value of the term. Dollar dollar equals dollar one plus dollar three. If the expression consists of just a term, then this is the dollar one, and all you need to do is just copy the value. Dollar dollar equals dollar one like this. And again, Bison will replace these dollar things with some internal variables that it uses. So it can be compiled by your normal C compiler. And this particular action, just copy dollar one to the result, is the default. So I wouldn't have needed to, to write this. I can skip this part. Uh, here, dollar one. No, because dollar two is not the plus character. It is the the value of that part of the expression. So I need an actual plus here because this is this is a in all the dollar things are variables. So let's say it's called x one, x two, and x three. So if I wrote $2 here, it would translate to x1, x2, x3, which would give a, a compiler error when you, or rather a syntax error when you compile it later with a C compiler. Yes, please can you repeat what happened there in the default? Here. Yes. Uh, <coughs> copying the value of $1 to $$, uh, just taking the value of this and let it be the value of the entire expression. That's the default value. So if I hadn't written this, it would have done it the same. Uh, or it would have done the same thing, since it's, it is the default. Okay? Uh, we have terms, and it's almost exactly the same code, but with terms and factors and multiplication. So if you have a term, you can take another term and chain on a factor at the end, or you can have 
a single factor that you then call a term. So <clears throat> again, you can have these two productions. And here you would need to write dollar dollar equals dollar et, which is this term, times dollar two, which is the value of this term, or this factor rather. So, uh, maybe dollar three. Oh, thank you, thank you. Of course, uh, <coughs> this is number one, this is number two, and this is number three. So don't make that same mistake. And again, since this is the default, I don't need to write actually uh, dollar dollar equals dollar one. A factor. Uh, now we're down to single digits. So a factor can be a single digit. And to be able to work with parentheses, so you can say, for example, 2 plus 3 minus 4 times 5. All you need to do in your grammar is to say that, okay, a factor can be a single digit, but it can also be any expression inside parentheses. So I'm saying if you have two parentheses like this and an expression between them, that can also be a factor. So expression consists of terms that consist of factors that can be either single digits or parentheses. And in this case, well, dollar dollar equals what? Where do you get the dollar dollar value? Yeah, dollar two. This expression, of course. And in this case, well, the default action is dollar dollar equals dollar one. So you get dollar one, which is the value of digit. But now I have no, <coughs> I can't write a production that says how to calculate the value of a digit. Because digit is a terminal, it's not a non-terminal. So I cannot do some things like this, da 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 da. Because that doesn't work. But all these dollar values have to come somewhere from. Where does everything, uh, where does it all start? Well, it starts with the tokens. So if I write the number five in my input, which is interpreted as a digit, then of course <coughs> this will be the starting point. I get the number five from this digit. And let me continue here. <coughs> uh, I've added percent percent, which means now we are <coughs> coming to this final third part of the input file, that is C code. And I will put all the C code for this uh, calculator in the same file. And the first part I will do is to put the scanner here. Why, why, Lex? Because <coughs> Bison assumes that the scanner is called Y, Y, Lex. Y for yuck and Lex for lexical analyzer. Uh, when the Bison parser needs a new token, it will just call yylex and yylex will read the input normally from standard input and analyze it and return the, the uh, token. Uh, there is an, a variable called yylval which stands for yuck yuck uh, lexical value where we will put the actual value 5 in this case. But let's write this complete scanner.
Very simple scanner. I call get char to get the next character from the input. The tokens that I can work with are, well, single digit numbers plus multiplication and parentheses. And you remember that we included ctype.h, which has some macros to see if a character that we have found is um, a digit or what it, what it is. So, if the character I read is a digit, if is digit C, then I know I found a digit. So, in that case, I will first leave one empty line, but then at the end say return digit. Because I found a digit and we said that, okay, one of the token types we'll work with is digit. And this will actually be uh, a macro or uh, an enum that has a value of 2, 5, 6 or something like that, uh, which I will return to the parser from this scan. Okay? But again, elval, the lexical value. Okay, I found a digit, but which digit? And as I said, <coughs> the lexical value, Bison expects that the lexical value will be put in a variable called yyelval. So when it founds a digit, when it found a digit, it will look at yyelval to see what one is. And how do I translate this digit that I read, this character that I read to the corresponding number? Because if I write this, elval equals c, what I've done then is that I put the character code for the number 5, or the character 5, which is 64 or something like that. Uh, in the variable yyl. So I don't want to do that. Instead I want to translate this single character to its, the number it corresponds to. And how do I do that? Cast. Well... You subtract the character from zero. Yeah, I would do that. Because just casting won't help you. It will just change the data type, not the value. But if I do this, Okay, here in C I have the character code for the character 5. If I subtract the character code for 0, I will get 5. And this works because what are characters? They are small integers that are codes for the actual characters. In some other languages you can't do this because it, uh, <coughs> the type system will complain, but in C you can do it. A character is an integer, which we can see, if nothing else, because I put it in an integer variable. So you mean by or casting or? Here. Yes. I subtract the character code for the character zero. This is zero. So if uh, the character code for five is... Uh, 64, and the character code for 0 is uh, uh, 59. Well, 64 minus 59 is 5, so the result will be 5. And if you have an ASCII table, you can look up what the actual character codes are. You return the digit or you return the uh, lexical value? I return the digit because the parser wants to know what token did I find. And the lexical value is already defined. It is put in yyelval, which is a variable that exists, yes. Okay, now, if I found a digit, I return digit and also put the lexical value, which digit it was, in the variable yyelval. But if it was something else, then I just return c, the character code for the character. 
So if it is something else that I'm using in my parser here, in my grammar, like plus, like multiplication, like parenthesis, or for that matter, uh, <coughs> end of line, all those characters are just forwarded to the parser from this very simple scanner. Also, all other characters, if I uh, write a... Um, uh, a letter such as A, that will also be forwarded to the parser from the scanner. Because the scanner doesn't really check what it is that is found, it just forwards it. But then I will get a syntax error in the parser because it cannot match this letter A. Okay? And we also need a main function. So at the end here, I put, well, what do I need to do? I need to call the parser because Bison generates a parser, but I need to actually start the program, start the parser. And what is the parser it generates? Well, it's a function called yyparse. So if I from main call yyparse, then all this will start happening. And this will be our complete calculator that can add and multiply single digit numbers. Almost. Uh, Bison all also expects there to be a function called yyerror that it can call with a string when it's found uh, an error in the input. So if it cannot parse, it will call yyerror. So uh, I think you need to always define this function too. Okay. Comments so far? Now you've seen <coughs> that Bison creates a parser that both handles semantic actions. You can have print. And it also handles uh, the attributes in a decorated parse tree, uh, except that it's just one single attribute, the dollar values. And the dollar values have to come somewhere from, they come from the scanner, which put them in yyl1, which is the lexical value, and then they are sent around using these dollar things. Okay. So we need to define these three functions? Are they, are they uh, you need to define, you need to have yylex you need to define, and main as in any C program, and yy arrow, you need to define them, yes. And yyparse is the one that Bison creates for you. Uh, question? Yes. Regarding the semantic action uh, about uh, display the plus and minus uh, or to, to write it or display it in a postfix form. Yes. We did not define something like in here. Well, we have this one, but uh, <coughs> if we want to add a postfix, then we would need to add it. Well, this is, even if it works with dollar dollar things, uh, it is technically a semantic action. And you could put print um, star here. And you could add print plus there. Yeah. <clears throat> Working with terms and factors and expressions, that is um, uh, difficult and unnecessary when you have uh, bison. Because you can tell bison the priority and associativity of operators. So instead of 
saying that an expression consists of terms which in turn consists of factors, you can simplify this. You can say everything is an expression. And then you write a, an ambiguous grammar. If I leave some space for the um, Bison definitions up there, or rather Bison declarations up here, and say here that an expression in my uh, rule parts of the input can be an expression plus an expression, where you just do dollar one plus dollar two, which will ye yield the result dollar dollar, or it can be an expression minus an expression, and again, then you would need to say dollar dollar equals dollar one minus dollar two. Three. Say again. Oh, correction. Three. Yes. Thank you. Because dollar two is just the plus sign, which is not what we want. Or it can be an expression times another expression where you would need to say dollar dollar equals dollar one times dollar three. Or it can be uh, an expression divided by another expression. And you can probably guess the dollar dollar thing here. Dollar one divided by dollar three. Or it can be a uh, Parenth uh, start parenthesis, followed by expression, followed by end parenthesis. So now we can have expressions with parentheses in them. Dollar dollar equals dollar two, because I want number two here. Or it can be a number, or may maybe even other things. But <coughs> here we have a clearly a very ambiguous grammar. 2 minus 3 minus 4 minus uh, or times 5. Okay, should I start by this one or this one? What should I do? Well, what we want to do is follow the normal rules. So this expression, we should start by uh, multiplying 4 and 5 because multiplication has higher priority. Then minus has left associativity. We should start from the left with 2 minus 3 and then minus 4 times 5. So we get 2 minus 3 is minus 1, 4 times 5 is 20, so the result would be minus 21. And you will get warnings about shift-reduce conflicts when Bison tries to create this bottom-up parser. But we can fix this. I say that percent left plus minus, that is, plus and minus are left associative operators with the same priority. Then percent left multiplication and division, because they are also left associative and multiplication and division have the same priority. So you have higher priority the lower you go here. And almost all operators are left associative. Uh, for example, one that is right associative in C is uh, uh, the assignment operator. This means put 3 in Y and then whatever you put in, in Y will then be put in X. But that is one of the few right associative operators ever. So, very simple. And you don't need to think about uh, you don't need to think about <coughs> uh, priorities down here in the grammar. Everything is just expressions. And you don't, as we see, you don't need to think about first conflicts. You don't think, need to think about uh, 
left recursion, anything like that. It's all, it just works. Like Macintosh, right? Uh, and write and let's say non assos also. Uh, you can have things that are right associative, like the assignment, and non assos uh, means they are not associative at all. Uh, could be useful for um, comparison operators. You know, in, in Python, you can write things like this. Two is less than three is less than five, which, have, which will result in true. Or let me um, change this example so I get the wrong result. Um, Uh, okay, I switched it around. Uh, <coughs> three is bigger than two is bigger than one. In Python, that is true, because yes, three is bigger than two and two is bigger than one. But what happens in C when we do this? Well, left associative is three bigger than two. Yes, it is. So it generates not a value true because it's C and we do just use zero and one for false and true. And is one greater than one? No, it's not, it's the same. So the result of this will be zero, that is false in C. If I don't want to have these types of expressions at all, I can say non assos and then this would be, uh, this would be a syntax error because uh, this comparison operator has no associativity at all. One final thing. Um, un, uh, <coughs> you have two different minus operators. This, uh, minus three minus four. This minus operator is binary minus, it has two operands. But this one is unary, it has only one operand. And these have different priority and different associativity. Uh, if I write minus three, times four. Well, this minus binds directly to the next item. While if I do two minus this one, well, then it has a much lower priority. And if I try to do that here in my grammar, I have the serious problem that it's the same character, the same token. So for this to work, and let's say I uh, add that you can also have minus expression like this. Uh, I can also have minus expression like this. And then dollar dollar would be what? It would be minus dollar two. Because I take this one, which has the value two, and minus the value. Uh, but now I get this minus will have this associativity and this priority, which is not the one I want. So I can invent a new token that is u mi let's call it u minus for unary minus, which is right associative because minus minus three is first minus three and then minus the result of that. And then down here, I have to add percent pres, which means precedence, u minus. Oh, that one's right. U. So <coughs> here we should not use the precedence or the priority for uh, the minus operator, but for this u minus, which is 
it looks exactly the same, but in reality, it's a, a different operator. Okay. This won't be on the exam. <laughs> okay, any questions before we finish? Thank you.